probably the person that knows William for the least amount of time we met and talked this morning. He's a common and for many of you in the audience. William did his um, MPhil at, uh, in Hong Kong, where he reconstructed the green ecosystem by looking at changes from the 1950s to the present in the South China Sea, which is one of the most impacted marine systems on the planet. And so he was, since then, has been really involved in management plans in that area uh, to restore the fishery. And this uh, was telling me that they recently um, started a trawling ban in the Hong Kong region to try and balance the um, marine fisheries protection in that area. He came to UBC to do his PhD with Tony Pitcher, I think, in 2002 and then did his postdoc with um, Daniel Foley here. He then joined the faculty at the University of East Anglia for, between 2009 and 2011. And I think that was instrumental in establishing many of his connections in Europe at the time. He returned to UBC, he was lured back to UBC um, by a, with, for a grant tenure position. Those, are, those, those um, are dependent on receiving external funds. He's, he received an external grant to support this work from the National Geographic. And I think that it's telling that he left a regular paid position by being so interested in the work that was going on at the Fisheries Center and really believing that that was the way to get his career propelled in the direction that he wanted to propel it. In addition to continuing work on uh, management in uh, the Hong Kong area, He's been doing a lot of work about um, climate change and the role that this will play in future fisheries management. And has become so well known in this area, he was invited to uh, be an author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So he's, I think he's going to tell us a lot about this work today. Um, he has over 70 publications on his name and he's really an established career. So I'm very much looking forward to Thank you very much. Today, first of all, I will tell you about the vision and goal of my research program. After that, I will tell you three main areas of my research program. And specifically, I've selected some key projects and contributions that are made in each of these research areas to share with you. After that, I will talk about my future research direction. And then, I will talk about my outreach, because um, besides doing research, I strive to make a difference, make an impact in advancing marine conservation and fisheries management. And one of the key components of my research program is doing outreach. So I will talk about my experience on that and my future plan of, of, of doing outreach activities. At the end, I will talk about my experience and visions in my teaching and postgraduate supervisions. And then I will summarize by telling you my vision of how my research program and myself will contribute to the future development of the fisheries center. I'm sure all of you are well aware of the range of human activities that are affecting our marine ecosystem. <coughs> and one of the main in impacts of human activities on marine ecosystem is through overfishing. There are quite a range of previous studies that have already demonstrated the great big footprint of overfishing on the marine ecosystem. And this is one of the studies that myself contributed together with colleagues in the CMS project, such as Danny Foley, Reg Watson, Dirk Seller, and uh, and Rashid. Basically, we showed that uh, using the catch data from the CMS project, we showed that the global fisheries is now reaching most part of the oceans. But at the same time, the catch, uh, the catch where you make efforts that we calculated uh, from the catch and effort database shows that um, there is more than 50% reduction in the catch per unit effort on average globally in the last 15 years. This suggests a large scale reduction of exploited biomass 
through fishing, and there is a strong implications on the rest of the ecosystem. In fact, my realization of the big impacts of overfishing started from my work when I was in Hong Kong. This is um, a first ever scientific, scientific publication of myself that I co-authored with a Yvonne Sibildi in the University of Hong Kong. What Yvonne and I did was to collect, it, was to collect historical archive. We interviewed local fishermen, as well as collecting information from databases and published and unpublished literature and government reports to reconstruct the historical change of a fishery of this species, which is the, called the Chinese Bar Harbor or the giant yellow coker in the last uh, century. This fish is remarkable. In terms, it can grow up to two meters in length, and this is very famous for its variable swim bladders. This is a photo that um, these fishermen gave me while I interviewed him. What I study find is that this species, because of overfishing, has become commercially extinct in most of its range throughout the East and South China Sea. And in fact, our study is, is, is instrumental in um, helping to list this species as critically endangered under the IUCN Red List, and it, it is also now listed as state protected by the Chinese authority. Besides, after that, Tony Fisher and I are using much bigger databases of unpublished government data and to assess the, all the major fish stocks in the South China Sea. And basically, we find that the majority of the species has shown a decline in catch per unit effort of more than 60% in 15 years, from 1970s to the 1990s. And this is remarkable because it demonstrated that the big depletions of fish resources in that region. I'm sure every one of you realize the, the big impacts of overfishing and that all of us are working towards a solution one way or another to reverse this trend, to restore fisheries, to conserve biodiversity. However, one of the major gaps that I have then identified in achieving that goal or vision in restoring fisheries is our knowledge of how global environmental changes will affect fisheries, marine ecosystems, and the way we protect, manage, or conserve them. Climate change is one of the biggest environmental issues in the last few decades. However, our knowledge about how climate change will affect marine ecosystems, fisheries, or conservation are still very incomplete. We know that changes in atmospheric and oceanographic conditions have a direct and indirect implications to marine ecosystems and our society at different levels of organization, from the effects on the, in, on the ideology of individual animals to changes in population dynamics, to change in ecosystem structure, community structure, to changes in, uh, in, in the fisheries, economics, and, uh, and the social side of fisheries. And at the bigger scale, it interacts with other global change issues, such as change in populations, migration, and uh, energy supply and the supply. However, as I mentioned, our understanding of how climate change affects each of these layers are still really incomplete as well as the interaction between these different layers of organization and how this eventually affects the way we manage our fisheries and also um, the biodiversity. So that's basically what I pose as one of the major goals for my research program. I call my research program the Changing Ocean Research Unit, which I started to establish this name when I moved to the fishery center. My unit aim to develop theoretical and empirical understanding on the vulnerability and biological responses of marine species, community and ecosystems to climate change, ocean acidification, and other human stresses. It also aim to help to use our scientific knowledge to explore options to improve fisheries management and marine conservation under climate change. All of this can then contribute to the overall vision of the fisheries center which is to restore fisheries, conserve aquatic life, and rebuild ecosystem by researching the options. I developed a framework for my research program to achieve these goals. One of the main components of my research program is to study the vulnerability and responses of marine ecosystems and fisheries to climate change and other human stresses at a global scale. 
based on the understanding on the fundamental mechanisms that govern the ecosystem to respond to these changes, as well as their vulnerabilities, use, and using computer and computative simulation models. My program also aims to develop, we will also develop, um, use this approach to develop future scenarios of how the society, how our fisheries and the ecosystem will change under this, under climate change and other, other human stresses. And from the knowledge and insight that we got from the global analysis, this helped us to inform um, the analysis and studies at a much finer scale, at regional and local scales. At the same time, insights that we got from the much <coughs> finer scale study also helped us to provide knowledge to improve understanding at the global scale and changes. The global scale analysis relies strongly on using secondary data and databases, while the regional studies focus more on using primary data. All of this can contribute to our understanding on how climate change and other human stresses will affect fishery management and conservation and how we can do better marine conservation under climate change. As I mentioned, my research program tried to do, uh, take a, a, a bigger step by uh, communicating the scientific findings to improve fishery management and marine conservation. And that's why the outreach is a big component in my research program. And I will talk more about that later in my talk. In my research, there are, in my research program, there are main, three main research areas. First one is on the detection and attribution of climate change impacts on fisheries. The second area is on projecting biophysical responses on marine biodiversity and fisheries to climate change. The third area is on socio-economic and policy implications of climate change for fisheries and marine conservation. I'm going to talk about each of the research areas and I will show you some selected major contributions that are made in each of these areas. For detection and attributions of climate change impacts, I posted a question for my research, which is, does climate change affect fisheries? To address this question, I developed two main hypotheses. First of all, ocean warming has led to changes in species composition of fisheries catch. The second hypothesis is that climate change affects fisheries catch potential. We know that marine organisms, particularly fish and invertebrates, their biology are tightly, are, are directly affected by environmental conditions, particularly change in temperature, where the animals will grow at, um, optimally at a particular temperature, and they, their growth will be um, less well deformed when temperature increase or decrease from that optima. And at some point, the, the animals can not live because the water is too hot or too warm for them to live. And different animals have different uh, thermal preferences, and that uh, and the, the limits for them. And based on ecological theories, we know that species would, would, would act if there is an area where the water temperature increase, it's likely that some of the animals may become local extinct because the environment is not suitable for them to live, while some animals will start to invade into that area because the environment becomes more favorable for, for them to expand. And we would expect that these changes would have a direct implication for fishery catch, particularly the catch species composition. Because if there is a uh, warming and there is species invasion and local extinction, we would expect that the fisheries would be catching more warmer water species and less cooler species while the water warms up. So to test this hypothesis, I developed an index called the mean temperature of the catch, or MTC. This is a, uh, a study that uh, we are in, 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 in currently under review in nature and is um, going through the fourth round of review now. So the referee is looking at hopefully the final rounds of our response to their comments. So we are really hopeful that it will appear um, in the journal soon. Basically, if you look at this picture and assume that this is the catch compositions of a fishery, and uh, we can basically assign the medium preferred temperature for each of the species. For example, on the right-hand side, you can say that cod has a medium preferred temperature of 6 degrees Celsius, while the place has a medium preferred temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. And then we calculated the median, the mean temperature of the catch 
by calculating the average preferred temperature rated by the catch. This concept is quite similar to the mean temperature of the catch, except mean trophic level of the catch, except that trophic <coughs> level is now replaced with the medium preferred temperature. However, one of the uh, challenge for this analysis is that we don't have physiological information for the preferred temperature for all the species. So what we did is we use an indirect way to infer the preferred temperature by overlaying the distribution of the species over observed sea surface temperature to calculate the temperature preference profiles, which is the probability of occurrence over sea surface temperature. And then uh, we calculated from that profiles the median preferred temperature of the species. For example, uh, for, this, for this example of small yellow cooker, we calculated a median preferred temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. And we did that for all the uh, commercial exposure species. So this is a, an example of calculated change in mean temperature of the cache for all the large marine ecosystems in North and South America. We used the CRS cache database to make this calculation. The boxes outside the map represent the change in mean temperature of the catch from 1970 to 2000, 2006, while the map shows the range of change in sea surface temperature during the same period. Red means warming, while blue means cooling. The area on the really white hand side would send our ex theoretical expected change in mean temperature of the catch. We would expect that in temperate or subtropical region, mean temperature of the catch will increase continuously because of increasing tropicalization of the fish community. While in the tropics, it's slightly different because there's no room for new invasion. So the mean temperature of the cat will increase initially because of the disappearance of subtropical species. <coughs> and then it will stabilize because within there will be just tropical species. And we did that for all the large marine ecosystems in the world. We also try to uh, account for the effects of fishing and large-scale oceanographic changes uh, using indices such as North Atlantic Oscillation Indices, the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation Indices, to account for other confounding effects through fishing and large-scale oceanographic changes, uh, so that we can more clearly attribute the effects to long-term warming. What we find is that, on average, globally, the mean temperature per catch increased at the rate of 0.19 degrees Celsius per decade. And the rate of change is significantly related to the rate of change of sea surface temperature within each large marine ecosystem. And uh, the, the calculated change in mean temperature of the catch in the tropics match exactly as we expected. So the mean temperature of the catch increased, uh, it is indicated by the red line there, mean temperature of the catch increased initially and then it level off. Although the sea surface temperature along all the tropical LMDs increased continuously, this basically highlights a worrying picture for the tropics because it means that it is likely that they are losing some tropical species while some of the tropical species will be suffering from warming in the region. Besides change in composition of the catch, we also try to see where the climate change effect is affecting the magnitude of the catch. So using um, macroecological theories, we derive a theoretical relationship between the maximum catch potential and some of the macroecological factors, such as the net primary production, species distribution area, the trophic level of the species. From that, we fit our models using observed data of maximum catch potential. We fit the model to observe catch potential of a dozen species of fish and invertebrates, and these include species from krill to tuna and sharks. And we found a, a reasonable good fit, and the model has seemed to have a, a good uh, explanatory power for the uh, variations of the catch potential. And from this analysis, we came up with an empirical relationship that allowed us to predict maximum catch potential based on change in net primary production as well as the range area of the species. And we know, based on other studies, we know that net primary production has been changing because of climate change in the last 50 years. We know that species distribution range area is changing, are changing in the last uh, 30 years or so. And from that, we can infer that climate change is having an effect also 
in the maximum catch potential of the species. This will come up again when I look when I talk about projection. Besides looking at the broad scale attribution and detection, we also look at more finer scale attribution and detection. For example, this is a study by my PhD student Tina Kirby. Um, her project looked at the detection and attribution of wind shift of commercially imported fish stocks in the North Seas. And this is a, um, a study that she did using the long-term historical data, so essentially historical data of survey data by the British um, Fishery Laboratory to analyze uh, the, the red shift of North Sea whiting. So the main findings of this part of my research is that ocean warming has already been affecting global fisheries through changes in species composition. Also, tropical fisheries have been particularly impacted because of the negative impacts on both subtropical and tropical species. Climate change can affect maximum catch potential through changes in species distribution and primary production. The second part of my research area is on projecting the future responses of marine biodiversity and fisheries to climate change. And for this, the first question that I pose is how will marine fish and invertebrates be affected by climate change by 2050? <coughs> to address these questions, I developed quantitative computer simulation models to make projections of how climate change will affect species distribution, abundance, and biodiversity patterns. I, did, I pioneered an approach called the Dynamic Biochemical Envelope Model, and this is now considered to be one of the state of the art in species distribution modeling. It starts with uh, this, this full chart to understand the structure of the models. It is quite complicated, and I'm not going to discuss all the details in this presentation. But if you are interested, I'm more than happy to talk about this in more details after my presentation. So it starts with predicting current species distribution, and then it, by overlaying with other environmental variables such as temperature and uh, depth, it inferred the patterns of the animals to these environmental conditions. At the same time, so we got projections of changes in uh, environmental conditions from colleagues who work on global climate and ecosystems modeling. All of these are then used to drive a biological model that simulate the changes in ecophysiology, world population dynamics, and in a newer version of our models, trophic interactions. And actually, this component represents uh, the major advancement in species distribution modeling. At the end, our uh, models make predictions of future species distribution. For predicting species distribution, myself and colleagues in the fisheries in the CLS projects pioneered an approach uh, for making predicting current species distributions based on some easily obtainable range information. It's called, we call it the CLS project approach. We also compare this approach with other commonly used species distribution modeling approach. Here we compare, uh, this is a study led by my PhD student, Miranda Jones. Um, we compare the, uh, the predictions from Maxen, Aquamap, and CLS project models. Maxen is an approach that uses maximum entropy theories, while Aquamap um, is actually an approach developed uh, in the fishery center by our alumni, Christine Krishna. She is now based in Germany. So we make predictions of this species distribution and then compare that with observed occurrence data. The main conclusion from our study is that all the three models make reasonable predictions about species distribution, and we cannot say that which one is better than others. The three models differ in terms of its data intensity as well as its flexibility to use expert knowledge. We stick with our approach because um, it has the least data intensity and most flexibility in using expert knowledge, which allows us to apply our modeling approach to a wide range of species, in basically all the commercially exploited species. In my presentation, I will be showing you projections under climate change scenarios developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I will be presenting you two scenarios interchangeably, interchangeably A2 and a one this basically depicts a world of around 1 degree Celsius increase in water temperature by 2050 relative to the 2000 period. 
So we make projections of future distributions for 1,066 species of fish and invertebrates, and we combine these projected projections together to make instances of changes in species, uh, patterns of species invasion and local extinction. The map on the upper side represents a uh, rate of species invasion, where it means high rate of species invasion. So it clearly shows that invasion would concentrate a lot in the high in high latitude regions such as the Arctic and Southern Oceans because basically of the forward movement of the species. The map of local extinction so show a quite a different story where range of local extinction would concentrate along the tropics and in the subpolar regions. This is because polar species and tropical species tend to have a much narrower temperature tolerance limits compared to species that live in intermediate latitudinal range. Also, species in semi and coastal sea are also projected to be impacted because the land boundaries provide a natural barriers for shift in distribution of those species. And so the species in semi and coastal seas, such as the Mediterranean, would have to suffer from warmer warming waters without being able to shift their distribution to other regions. We also projected the range of friendship of the species, which is expressed as the kilometer, uh, how much distance is shift to high latitude regions in a unit of time. We find that on average, the species will shift at a rate of around 40 kilometers per decade, and that pelagic species tend to shift much faster than immersive species. This, all of these works contribute to, uh, I think, a project that look, that aim to develop global scenarios of change in Earth biodiversity, and the project is published in Science in 2010. Besides looking at global scale projections, we also look at regional scale and local scale projections. This is one of the examples. Um, this is a study commission, commissioned by Environment Canada. We, they want to know how Canadian biodiversity, marine biodiversity, in the Canadian bio regions will shift by 2050 relative to now. And these are some of the results of that analysis. These studies uh, was featured in a Royal Society <coughs> of calendar report led by Jeff Hutchings that look at the current and future status of biodiversity, marine biodiversity in calendar. One of the questions, challenge that we have to address is the skills or how well are models in projecting future distributions. To address that challenge, what we did is uh, we used our models to historically reconstruct the distribution of the species in the last 30 years and compare with data, compare with data collected from surveys. In these cases, we compare data from the Bering Sea and the North Sea. And these are the results, and we find our study shows that there are significant and reasonable agreements between observation and um, model high cast, although there are uh, strong in the species variation. But at the community level, there are strong uh, um, significant uh, agreements between the observations and models projections. This provides some confidence for our projections in, uh, in terms of how our species distributions would change in the future and the climate change. Another challenge that we are addressing is the issues of model structural uncertainty. And this actually is the phase of the art in the field where we are moving towards more model ensemble or model comparison. <coughs> we started, we are one of the first group to address these questions in our research and um, this, this work is led by my PhD student Miranda Jones and um, it's just it's being impressed now. We applied uh, the model ensemble to a case study that looked at the invasion of Pacific oyster in the UK. We used three different species distribution models, Aquamap, Maxen, and, um, and the, um, our, our model, dynamic biochemical and the models. At the same time, we used multiple climate scenarios, uh, climate models projections from different uh, climate models. And this is the projection change in species distribution range, range central in terms of how much kilometer you will shift to high latitude region. 
for Pacific Oyster. We then combine these models and identify area where there's good agreements across models, across climate models, and across species distribution models, which is highlighted by the wet area, well, and identify where there's very high uncertainty in our projection. And this is shown to be really useful for policy making because this could provide policy making some information on where our scientific assessments have been in terms of confidence in our projection so that they can design management and uh, policies that will take into account this um, understanding of the uncertainty of the projections. Another challenge that we are trying to meet is about tropic interactions. The earlier versions of our models, in fact, most of the species distribution models, do not consider trophic interaction. And we take that as a, as a, as a key challenge because um, we want to know how trophic interaction will affect species distribution shape. So we develop a new version of the models that incorporate trophic interaction. And the, the, uh, this analysis, uh, led by the uh, Jose, Jose Fernandez, is now uh, in divisions uh, under consideration in global climate change global change biology. So basically, we link a, the species-based species uh, dynamic biochemical envelope model with links-based science-based theory. Basically, the science-based theories allow us to predict the flows of energy across different size class within the whole community of the system. And from that, it provides a constraint on the available energy at different size class within the whole community. At the same time, in, uh, with our models, we simulate the change in size spectrum for individual species with consideration on the available energy for a particular size classes, as well as this interactions, competitions, uh, predation, etc., for that particular size classes. And then we compare the projections, uh, compare the, the models, projections of reconstructing the future, uh, the past, and compare that with historical survey data. We compare the projections from our previous version of the models with and the new version of the model. What we find is that uh, the incorporation of trophic, trophic interactions would have a slight improvement in terms of the goodness of fit of the data, which improved around 5% of being able to explain more variance of the data. So it, there's around 5% improvement in its power in explaining the variations of historical wave of historical change in abundance for animals in the North Atlantic. We also explore other routes to incorporate trophic interaction in our models, for example, through linking our outputs to other modeling approach for ecosystems such as EcoPath with EcoSim. This is a case study for the Northeast Pacific. I'm not going to talk about this into details, but just to highlight the potential of linking our models output to other existing approaches. In fact, VD's uh, global EcoPath with EcoSim model is currently being driven as part of the components by outputs from our models to incorporate the potential effects of climate induced shift in distributions in their global simulations of changes in, dish, uh, in the ecosystem dynamics um, in the future. The second question that I posed for the research areas on projections is on how would global change affect or the size of marine species in the world ocean. This study is just, uh, and in fact, previous studies focused strongly on climate change effects on shape and distribution, climate change effects on change in technology in the marine ecosystem. However, they often overlook the effects on body size of fish. But in fact, we have really good theoretical basis for the potential effects of climate change on body size of fish. This is a theory first proposed by Dan Daniel Pauly. Basically, the theory uh, says that marine fish and invertebrates are in a constant challenge of getting sufficient oxygen from water. This is especially the case as the fish or animals go bigger and bigger. When the, fish, when the animals grow bigger, the number of body size, body cells increase, and so is their demand for oxygen to support the increasing body mass. 
However, their ability to get oxygen from the waters do not increase proportionally. Because, for example, the surface of the gill area, the surface area of the gill, do not increase proportionally <coughs> as the uh, weight of the fish. So at some point, the fish will want more oxygen, and then uh, oxygen supply will just oxygen supply will just be enough to meet the oxygen demand. And that's at the point where the fish will meet uh, reach its maximum body size. And under a warming conditions, we know that uh, if a warmer temperature will increase the metabolic rate of fish, and so is its oxygen demand. But oxygen supply do not increase. That means that the fish will run out of oxygen at a smaller body size. And so the fish will basically will see a smaller body fish in a warmer world. If environmental oxygen levels decrease, then it will have a similar effect in reducing the body size of fish. We use the von Bodelampigl equation and derive a, uh, a mathematical expression linking uh, the growth rate as well as the maximum body size of fish to temperature and other ocean chemistry such as oxygen. And then we incorporate these mathematical models into our dynamic biochemical and to the model. This also allows us to make assessment on the effects of temperature on um, the, uh, the natural mortality, maturity, decadity, or recruitment on fish stocks. Besides that, besides the change in individual body size, because of the shift in distributions, we will we expected to see more tropical species. And we know that tropical species, there are more small body species in the tropics compared to high latitude region. So we in theory we would expect to see at the community level more smaller fish compared to um, in, in, a more, more in a warmer ocean. So uh, we try to generate scenarios of how body size will change by 2050 by running our simulation model. <coughs> this is the result that published in Nature Climate Change in last year. This is the map of change in maximum body size of fish community by 2050. Red means a decrease in body size, while blue means an increase. This is the latitudinal zone average of the change in body size at the community level. What we find is that at the assemblage level, average maximum body size is projected to, to decrease by 14 to 24 percent from 2001 to 2050. And the individual decrease in body size contribute about half of those decrease, while half, is, half of those decrease is contributed by the shift in distribution of species. Changes in the tropics and temperate regions are predicted to be large, with an average reduction of around 20 percent. The third question that we look at is what are the projections of future fisheries catch potential under the climate change? We want to know how much we will, how much the fishery yield will change under climate change. So I showed you this slide before when we look at the potential effects of climate change on fishery yield. Basically, we got projections of how future net pipe protection will change from global analysis of, uh, of uh, oceanography. We, based on our dynamic our climate envelope model, we got projections of how species distribution range area will change. And we can use this to, and we can use the empirical equation that we derived to make some predictions of how maximum catch potential will change under these changes. And that's what we did. This is a map of chain projected change in maximum catch potential by 2050s relative to now. Red means a large decrease in catch potential, while blue means increase. Basically, the main message is that there is a, a large decrease in maximum catch potential along the tropics, while it's likely to have an increase in high latitude region, such as the Arctic. Subsequently, we updated our analysis by considering more factors. We considered change, potential change in ocean chemistry, such as uh, the oxygenation. At the same time, we considered the potential interactive effects between overfishing and climate change. So 
what we did is that we obtained projections, latest projections of how ocean biogeochemistry will change based on global scale Earth system models. For example, from our colleagues in Princeton University. And then we run our models to calculate the overall change in maximum catch potential for the whole world ocean for more than 700 species of exploited fish and vertebrates from 2000 to 2050. And this is under a scenario of low climate change, just climate variability. You will see that basically there will be no change in catch potential, it's just some variation. And if we assume that the fish stocks are overfished, meaning that the fishing mortality is now two times natural mortality rate. Although the, the mean doesn't change, but we will see a bigger fluctuation. So it means that the stocks may likely to be more sensitive to climate variability. If we add temperature, so if we add temperature effects to it, global maximum catch potential is likely to decline by around 15%, 10 to 15% by 2050. If we were add oxygen effect to it, meaning that we incorporate the, the potential effects of ocean deoxygenation, it will add to this decrease by around 4% of change in maximum catch potential. How about overfishing? If we overfish the stock, would we increase or decrease the, the, the potential decline. So we add the scenarios of assuming that we are more or less uh, exploiting the stock at the maximum sustainable yield, which is with a uh, fishing mortality rate equals to the natural mortality rate of fish. And it results in a slightly more decline of maximum catch potential of around uh, 3 to 4%. But if we really hammer the stock, by overfishing it with uh, fishing mortality rate two times natural mortality rate. Basically, if we compare to a temperature only scenario, it will lead to more than 10% um, more reduction in overall catch potential. This highlights the potential interaction effects between maximum catch, uh, between climate change and overfishing. How about ocean acidification? So, if we add ocean acidification into our equation, we, um, what would the, be the potential changes in the maximum catch potential? We apply our models to a case study in the North East Atlantic. Here, the horizontal axis is the percentage change in the catch potential. By 2050, this would set increase, this is decreased. And these are different large marine ecosystems within the North East Atlantic. The black bar will send no climate change, while the open bar will send high sensitivity to ocean acidification. Uh, this is the black bar will represent no ocean acidification, while the open bar will send high sensitivity to ocean acidification. What we find is that um, with ocean acidification, it is likely that it will turn the it will lead to a large reduction in catch potential, particularly to some area where without ocean acidification it may have a slight gain, while with ocean acidification it may become a loss. But this is highly sensitive to our assumption of how sensitive the animals are to ocean acidification. And this is highly uncertain. And there are lots of research, so some of you in, uh, are doing uh, in looking at the different sensitivity of different organisms to climate at ocean acidification. But this study highlights the importance of understanding the sensitivity of the animals to ocean acidification because it can have a big impact on fisheries catch potential. <coughs> So the main findings are that the state-of-the-art species distribution models that we developed incorporate population dynamics, dispersal, ecophysiology, effects of ocean acidification, hypoxia, and trophic interaction. And this will present a major, major advancement in the field of <coughs> modeling species distribution. Our study provides the first ever projected global patterns of change in species biodiversity, invasion, local extinction, maximum catch potential, maximum body size, and the climate change. Also, our study highlights the potential interactions between climate change and overfishing, which presents potentially exacerbating the decrease in catch potential under climate change. So the third areas of my research program is on looking at the socioeconomic and policy implications of, of climate change for fisheries and marine conservation. For this part of the studies, I 
and um, very close collaboration with colleagues in the fishery center who are, for example, Rashid and the Fishery Economic Research Unit, as well as collaborators internationally. In this particular analysis, we link the projected change in species composition and the potential catch, poten catch potentials to changes in fishing costs, changes in fishing landings, fishing revenues, as well as changes in economic ranks of the global fisheries. And these are some examples of the results from the analysis. On the left hand side, this is a projected change in land values, the projected led by Vicky Lam on her PhD studies, which projected the potential change in land values for different country under climate change. And the right hand side is a projected change in the number of people who may be undernourished because of climate change effects on change in distribution of fish as well as the change in the maximum catch potential of fish. And this is led by uh, Andrew Dick, who was uh, a member of the Fishery Economic Research Unit. Besides global scale studies, uh, we also look at various regional socioeconomic impacts. For example, this is studies on West Africa, which was published in the African Journal last year. These studies aim to look at the socioeconomic um, implications of climate change as well as the implications for food security in the region. Again, it highlights a, a very worrying picture for the West African fisheries. Besides looking at the socioeconomic implication, we also look at the implication for policy and conservation. For this analysis, um, at the global scale, what we are trying to do is to look at the effect of change in species distribution on the performance of marine protected areas. The first analysis that we are currently doing is to look at how, what species and how many species are moving out of a marine protected area or moving into a marine protected area and how that may have implication on the performance of the marine protected area. <coughs> a computer analysis that we published this year in part one uh, was a case study in the UK. So we looked at similarly the effects of climate change on how uh, this overlap between uh, commercial and vulnerable species on the existing and planned marine protected areas around the UK. But besides looking at what the global and regional climate change issues, I also focus a lot on um, contributing to assessment for data limited fisheries, particularly those fisheries that are currently being threatened by overfishing. For example, um, these are two of the examples that I, uh, I am involved in. Uh, one example is the assessment for humhead wasp. We conducted a stock assessment for humhead wasp, particularly. We developed a stock assessment models for Indonesia to help them to set the quotas for, uh, to comply for CITES requirement uh, for their export. <coughs> and this is a study that is uh, collaborated with Yvonne Stobi, Andrew Pan, and colleagues in the FAO. And more recently, I led a study on assessing the fisheries, uh, the national group of fisheries in the Bahamas. Um, and the analysis was published um, this year in uh, endangered species research. I don't, I do not only work with computer or data. I also work with people. This is uh, a very interesting patch project that I am involved in as a uh, as one of the uh, partners in the um, with colleagues in UK and uh, in Kenya. The objective of this analysis is to understand the trade-off in fisheries management in Mombasa, in Kenya. And we use one of the big components of this project is on participatory modeling. What we did is we organized uh, secondary stakeholder workshops in Kenya, in Mombasa. We collect, we generated information about how the social and ecological systems are connected in the Mombasa coast. And through these workshops, and then we, based on this information, we develop a social ecological models about the coast using the theological expert system. And then we develop a really neat user interface where we allow the stakeholders to pay, play around these models. The idea is to allow them to understand and stimulate them to explore the trade-offs in managing the coast, as well as stimulate them to think of innovative ideas 
of managing the codes in Mombasa and find a win-win solution. Yeah, this is me. Okay, so the main findings for our analysis is uh, climate change is projected to have large implications for the economics of fishing and the nutritional security of many coastal communities, particularly those in the tropics. Climate change complicates the development of effective fisheries management and marine conservation policies, with impacts that are dependent on regions, species, and the management objectives of that fisheries or um, of that particular region. Our program contributes to the management of tropical data limited fisheries management and marine conservation through actively participating and contributing to the assessment of those fisheries and informing the government in in those uh, informing those and informing the government in about management policies in that region. So I've selected some examples of regional assessment and this map will show you all the case, regional case study that my research program is involved in. So basically this covered most part of the world with all the continents. In terms of future research directions, first of all in the area of vulnerability and, um, and responses of the marine ecosystem. I'm working on developing a vulnerability assessment framework for marine biota that use readily available biological information. That will be similar to the approach that I developed for assessing the vulnerability <coughs> of fishing for my PhD thesis, so that it can be applied to um, area with limited data. One of my previous research, one of the major gaps that I identified in some of the research that I just showed you is that there will be high vulnerability and impact in the tropics, and those areas are of the data limited. So a lot of my research will be dedicated to find ways to identify how them to understand the vulnerability and develop a management and fisheries, fishery management and conservation policy with limited data. So this project is funded by NSERC uh, Discovery Grant. And uh, I will continue to look at the interaction between different human stresses and climate change. And there are lots of uh, we are we are collaborating with Daniel on this, and there are lots of um, additional opportunities for collaboration with uh, Tony's group and Billy's group. I will continue to do um, an impact assessment for ocean education. Particularly, we are tasked to do various regional impact assessment for ocean education for fisheries, uh, with funding from Inter international atomic agency. Uh, Rashid and I are involved in these collaborations. We are going to assess the fisheries vulnerability to ocean applications in, uh, in, in Kenya, in uh, Abu Dhabi, in the Philippines, in Chile, and in Brazil. So we're going to do that in the next few years with funding from IEA. And also, uh, I think there are lots of scope for developing collaborations with Derek and Sam, particularly in terms of using the uh, experimental uh, data from their analysis to inform the departments of modeling analysis of looking at how the species will be sensitive to ocean education. Also, um, I'm, think, I'm working on the department more on assessing the vulnerability of culturally important fisheries. For example, the aboriginal fisheries in BC, um, Muyoshi uh, and I are start, have already started working on that through the projects of uh, Moen which is our uh, master student, and we will continue to expand on this in the future. In terms of developing future scenarios, as I mentioned, one of the uh, major directions in the field is to develop multimodal ensemble analysis, and we've already started to move into that direction. So we will expand on that for our Google analysis as well, which I'm working on that. And I can see that um, there are lots of scope for potential collaboration with, for example, Murdoch School. Because, um, as I said, we want to use our analysis to inform policy decisions. And Murdoch's expertise in um, assessing uncertainty and assessing how those uncertainty can help to inform policies would be very useful in uh, linking uh, this work to more policy impacts. Also, um, we are using 
we are building more connection with physiologists who do experimental works with our, with our model development. We are involved in various UK uh, Europe initiatives in doing these kind of works. One of the examples is a collaboration with University of Plymouth. Um, we are supervising a PhD student where the students are doing experimental works um, in the UK while she will be doing uh, modeling works in here using the experimental information that she collected from the UK. Adaptive and evolution responses, I think, is a big topic, and uh, we are. And it is actually one of the things that I committed to do in my NSERC one. And I'm already a PhD student, uh, Vijay, who is working on this area, particularly uh, aiming to use a model to explore different um, hypotheses and scenarios of how adaptive and evolutionary responses will affect the projection of species distribution. Um, I'm interested in getting more into expanding the works from fish and vertebrates to high trophic level animals, such as birds and mammals. There's some potential source of funding from environment candidates of expanding that part of the work. And I can see a lot of collaborations with, I think there's definitely a, a collaboration potential for Marine Mammal Research Unit, who have been already been doing some work in this area. And then uh, we continue to my work on the socio-ecological scenario development. Particularly, Rashid and I have just completed a uh, partnership grant uh, on looking at developing socioeconomic scenarios for calendar in terms of ocean management. And the climate change scenario is the big component of it, and I'm a, 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 a co-PI of this one. For implication for policies, um, we've actually in the final shortlisted uh, stage for uh, a proposal uh, competitions in the UK as per uh, program ecosystem service for poverty alleviation call in expanding our analysis in Kenya to the whole West Indian Ocean coast. So I'm, uh, I'm a, 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 a co-PI of that one. As I mentioned, um, we're looking into the implications of climate change on entry policies. And there are lots of potential for collaboration with our project, the races, and project Seahorse on this one. And um, also, as I mentioned, the tropics will be an area that I have, I will focus a lot in the next few, uh, next part of my research. So, uh, one part of future research is looking at the implications for tropical and uh, fisheries for climate change and marine conservation. I include China here because, um, and because of my cultural tie and because of the uh, big gaps in understanding climate change in, in that region. So in terms of uh, outreach, I, my research is trying to advance marine conservation and fisheries management. And, um, and I, I, do, I, do, I, I do that through various avenues. One part of it is through participating in high-level international initiatives. I am invited to be the lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the uh, Ocean System chapter, which is the first time in the IPCC which had an ocean dedicated chapter. So I'm one of the six lead authors in that chapter. Uh, I'm also lead authors in uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook and other high level uh, international assessment for climate change impacts such as uh, Global uh, World Bank uh, Assessment. Besides, I work very closely with UBC Public Affairs as well as that, um, NGOs um, in, in the US, in Canada, and uh, in, internationally to publicize my research work so that uh, the public will get the latest scientific development about climate change impacts on the ocean and develop ways of, um, of dealing with these problems. These are some of the news clips that I, I, I included from my various previous research. I also provide direct advice to civil society. I am the scientific advisor of various international and local organizations, such as uh, the Biodiscovery Bio Program, which is part of Pact of Diversity in Europe. Um, I'm the scientific advisor for WWF Calendar, National Geographic, uh, the IUCN Species Specialist Group, as well as uh, a local NGOs, um, Shark Truth, who are dedicated to shark conservation. Teaching and postgraduate supervision is a big component of my research program because I can see that um, it is important 
that our students, undergraduate or postgraduate students, to understand uh, the challenge of ocean sustainability so that they can take action, whether they go into the private sectors, uh, government, academia, or NGOs in the future. In terms of undergraduate and master level teaching, I have a wide range of experience uh, from teaching uh, these different courses, which are examples of courses that I have taught before. I taught in three different universities, uh, University of Hong Kong, University of East Anglia, and UBC. And tomorrow, in the sample, in the sample lecture that I will give in the center, I will, uh, I will use one of the lecture from my, from my course, Ecological Modeling, that I organized and taught at UDA. At the moment, in UBC, I'm teaching uh, the first year science seminar, which is part of the Science One program. I taught to students about uh, the philosophy of science, scientific method, and in general, science as a community in the society. I also organize and teach the, uh, the, the fishery science uh, introduction course, Fish Part 20. Many of you have um, taken this course before, or taught in this course as well. In the future, I am really enthusiastic about contributing to the, uh, to the reform and um, teaching of uh, quantitative analysis fisheries course, the Fish 504 and 505. Some of my course actually are quite similar to, uh, to Fish 504 and 505 that I talked before, so I can see that I can contribute quite directly to, to teaching these courses. Also, I know that science is developing a uh, science sustainability course, and I think this is an excellent initiative, and I am really enthusiastic about participating in teaching this course. And I'm also thinking of organizing a new course called Marine Conservation and Fisheries Under Global Change. Right now, climate change is mentioned or touched, up or touched by various different causes across the campus. However, there's no a single course that focuses on looking at climate change in fisheries and marine conservation. So I think there's a big gap that I can fill. Especially, there was some discussion about organizing a professional master degree in the, in the fishery center. I think this course can be one of the core course that contribute to that uh, master, professional master degree if it is going to happen in the future. Also, uh, I'm uh, in the, in the, at the moment uh, developing a proposal for the NSERP Collaborative Research Training Program. Basically, it is to develop a, a course campus uh, training program for climate change ocean management that build on top of the existing um, disciplinary program in each of the department. So it will be a course department training program across uh, Earth and Ocean Sciences, Geography, Zoology, and ILES. I was talking to Sally this morning, and she actually got one of these um, before for the Biodiversity Center. And, uh, and she, she, this is an excellent uh, opportunity for the graduate students, postdoc, as well as undergraduate students. Currently, my research unit has one postdoc, four PhD, and one main MSc student. And these are the projects that they are involved in. In the future, uh, in the very near future, actually next term, um, I will have two more PhD students that I just recruited, and one MSc student. And my postgraduate studentships focus strongly on interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, diversity, as well as collaborations within the group and with people outside the group. In terms of interdisciplinarities, my group has, has a social scientist, has a biologist, has computer scientist. And in terms of diversity, I ensured a balance in terms of gender as well as culture. For example, I have students from India, I have students from, and my new students are going to be from, uh, from China and from Trinidad, from Caribbean, I have students from the UK and Canada. So this is my vision of how my research will be integrating with the, uh, with the whole center. Climate change is such a cost-cutting issue that actually it, 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 uh, almost all of the research units in the fishery center would be of interest. So my works would, be, uh, would, would connect to all the uh, research units within the fishery center, and in fact, in the last few years, I've already developed collaboration with most of these units, uh, formal or informal, and I'm constantly looking for new opportunities to develop collaborations 
new collaborations with uh, unit, with other units in the center. At the same time, um, I'm in close collaborations also with uh, departments outside of the university. For example, uh, in, in the EOS, zoology, ILES, geography, we have been discussing about establishing the, a, a, a cross campus initiative called the uh, Changing uh, Climate Change Ocean Initiatives, which is an informal um, collaboration network across the universities for researchers who are interested in doing climate change related research. Of, co of course, uh, uh, my research unit will continue, continue to maintain and expand my international collaborations. So this is my vision of how my research unit would contribute to the fishery sector future development. My unit will contribute to making the fishery center an international center of excellence in researching climate change. And in fact, we are already there. I think if you talk to someone outside UBC uh, and ask them about uh, doing climate change research on fisheries, fishery center will be one of the uh, one of the uh, center that they, they will first come into their mind. Um, in that research area, and we will go, continue to go uh, to, to develop that and make sure that we will be one of the dominant mm. groups in doing this research. My project, my units will help the Fisheries Center to become an international training center of highly qualified personnel on climate change and conservation and fishery management research through some of the initiatives that I just mentioned to you. Also, um, I hope that my research unit can help the Fisheries Center to continue to provide advice to both international, national, and local governments, civil society, and the public on conserving our diversity and fisheries management, particularly under climate change. And overall, in, in addition, I think I will add to the diversity of the Fisheries Center uh, faculty members as bringing in um, a, a different cultural perspective from, 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 Chinese, uh, from China as well as bringing in my collaboration networks and, uh, and, uh, and my personal networks in China as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. There are lots of other 
factors that is affecting the, the intermediate changes and needs of the, of the fisheries, uh, particularly some of the small scale fisheries. And because of that importance for those other issues, there are lots of research being conducted in that area. The research, are lots of research, for example, in the fishery center are already addressing those issues. But the effects of climate change, how they add to those issues, and how that affects the, uh, the more the medium to long term management is something um, still a big gap in our knowledge. Particularly, for example, for some of the research findings that I showed you, um, there is going to be a big impact on, on tropics and on the loss of the Arctic countries' fisheries. I'm not that worried about the high latitude regions' fisheries because they are developed. They are in developed countries. They probably have their capacity to deal with uh, long-term changes. It is the small-scale changes, or it is the uh, changes in the tropical fisheries, in the medium to long-term, that is really worrying. I think um, it, 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 we should think about it now, in order to make uh, reduce that, uh, help the communities to adapt to those impacts. Although the impacts will be medium to long-term, and that add to the other um, concerns that um, the communities are, are focusing on. So I think my research, the reason why I, I, I put climate change as one of the focus is because this is a big gap in our knowledge. But what we find, of course, is many governments would rather talk about climate change than a lot of the proximate issues, because climate change can be negotiated in a whole different framework. And you know as well as I do, a lot of Asian countries will do anything to avoid managing their fisheries. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking of connecting back down your climate trying to set relative importance on both urgency and temporal scales of climate change versus other imperatives, because climate change is so sexy, it can mm -hmm. actually distract us from the immediate, rather critical issues, yes. especially government. Yes, I think uh, that's very um, important point indeed. Uh, and some of the, I hope that through sure. my um, advice to both the, uh, at the high level as well as uh, through international assessments, or to advising governments or NGOs, we will be able to communicate to the government how climate change would add to other more pressing effect, uh, issues uh, of affecting the fisheries or affecting marine conservation in a particular area, and how we can deal with developing policies that would address the most pressing issues, but at the same time address the more long-term issues of climate change. For example, uh, let me give you an example. There are, we find that um, there are, for example, for, for my studies, um, better manage the fisheries already can build in a lot of capacity to um, help the fisheries and help the ecosystem to adapt to climate change. And that's actually provide a added co-benefit of improving management of rebuilding fish stocks and better conservation. And that actually help to actually address the more pressing issues, for example, of overfishing, rather than um, diverting resources to climate change. And also through doing more, um, some of the more very local studies, for example, through uh, involvement with, with communities, we can actually tease out what are the, um, the most pressing issues and what are the less pressing issues, and co-developing a uh, idea for managing the coast that will adjust both these short-term and long-term changes. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk and uh, really ambitious and it's really impressive. It's, it's related to the two points that have been made already. When you showed that graph going forward of the relative change in yield when you had temperature versus fishing, you doubled the fishing pressure mm -hmm. to quite a high level, twice of M for example, and it had this actually relatively small effect relative to the, to the temperature. Mm -hmm. How are you going to discuss and deal with this issue which is relevant to two questions we've had already? about the, the, this trade-off between caring about climate change, which is relatively uncertain, versus a smaller, apparently smaller effect of something which is more certain. That seems to be a really important challenge in your like, trying to communicate the importance of your work, you know? Yeah. So um, the figure that I show you, that shows a, a added 10% reduction in uh, reduction in catch potential because of fishing, is, is the, the effect on the, um, the potential catch Mm -hmm. So, uh, in reality, the abundance will it will already drop a lot by adding uh, an overfishing scenario. So we are just looking at the, the, the protection uh, potential for the stocks. And uh, 
I think that kind of research highlights the importance of addressing the issues together rather than separately, because um, they interact with each other. Uh, climate change and overfishing may have excessively, they, they have affected excessively <coughs> the, uh, uh, the effects from this, any single impact. And I think that also uh, bring in bring the, the uh, part of the answer to what uh, Amanda is alluding to is have the need to integrate these assessments together. We can, cannot, often cannot have separated the issues really clearly to uh, clearly away it one issue another. And I think um, it will, we should uh, look in the ways that we can uh, find the solution to address these short-term and long-term issues um, at the same time. Hi, William. I'll echo. Um, that was really interesting, and it was great to see all of your work brought together in that way. It was informative. I'm just curious. Um, you rely, obviously, in your work a lot on modeling. And to create models, we have, often have to make assumptions, which is totally fair, and we need to do that to move forward. So I'm not um, questioning that. But the nature of your talk meant you didn't have time to really talk about the assumptions behind your models. And I'm just wondering if you've had to make any assumptions in order to move forward with your research that are worrying you. So are there any assumptions that you um, feel like you need to explore a little bit further or that maybe, um, yeah, that just kind of you know keep you awake at night? <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I, I have those in my work. And I just, it was, you know, it'd be good to hear if there are any that you yes. had to make. That you Certainly, um, the, the interaction between the, the, um, the species ecosystems with the environment is a very complicated thing that all of you would know. And um, we, there are such, we, from the start of the, the works in addressing this issue of developing models of climate change, we are increasingly address, addressing different challenges of addressing different assumptions. So we start off with just a very relatively simple analysis of addressing the effects of temperature, ocean current patterns, salinity, and then uh, there's a, a question of criticisms about uh, ocean chemistry. How would ocean education, changing oxygen will affect that? So we tie the latest theories into our models to make that as, uh, assessment. And then uh, we try to, again, assess in the criticisms about tropic interactions. We are starting to adjust that with, uh, with, the, uh, with the analysis that I showed you. And uh, I think the next step that we are trying to do is on the evolutionary adaptive response. I talked to Stelia about that before okay, because she has also an interest on that area. So this is a, a really a difficult challenge because uh, we don't know how the species respond, whether the species can easily adapt both evolutionary or phenotypically to the changing conditions um, or not. So this is an area that I think um, Will, um, will be one of the focus of my research in terms of that modeling side um, for, the, for the near future. And also, um, there is inactively in uncertainty associated with all this modeling analysis because of the complexity of the issues. So one of the um, direction that we are moving to is to, in terms of multimodal ensembles, uh, we are still at the starting stage of that compared to, for example, climate modeling community. And so um, we are trying to catch it, catch that up. Uh, at the start, uh, we are using uh, different modeling approach to capture, to look at how structural uncertainty of the models will affect our projection, mm -hmm. and to provide a, a more informed uh, information about um, the range of uncertainties, particularly for policy makers. So that's a good first step. And then uh, we hope to continue to do that by, um, for example, using historical information to inform weighting between models mm -hmm. um, and incorporating more different uh, modeling approach, for example, um, to move that area forward. And can I just follow up just a really quick question? Wouldn't temperature and oxygen be correlated? If you seem to treat them as separate, but in, no. and I might be wrong, but as water temperature gets higher, doesn't oxygen availability decrease? So they're it's, not independent. It's more complicated than that because uh, <laughs> oxygen, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we are not looking at just a uh, beaker of uh, water and, and pump oxygen in it. A lot of it is due to the circulations and the um, and the um, the, that, uh, the export they call it the export transport of the um, organic materials that would that drive the uh, change in oxygen levels and uh, and also the stratification of the waters. That is also a, a main driving factor for the change in uh, distribution of oxygen levels in, in the ocean. Okay. <coughs> 
<coughs> yeah, William, you're on a good thing here because governments around the world are getting more and more nervous about climate change and so they're going to fund lots of work, which is great. <coughs> um, but climate change isn't just, I mean, you've you, you progressively narrowed, progressively added various components of climate change to do modeling, which is neat, right? So you start up with temperature and then you looking at the acidification and uh, some other effects as well. And the, the second door effects on, on fish physiology is, is neat. <clears throat> but there's more there. Um, you know, one of the things is the sea level rise, which could be a great thing for fisheries with all these uh, drowned cities acting as artificial reefs. <laughs> yeah. um, and also, one of the really worrying things for people is the increased variance. Uh, bigger storms, more hurricanes, this kind of stuff, which is really going to have a big effect on the certainly shallow waters. Have you thought about that yeah, uncertainty? About, yeah, I've thought about that for a long time. It's, we look at, we, we do a total analysis, so it's just a fishery sector, but um, it's a whole, a whole, whole new piece to look at the core sector analysis and mm. uh, looking at global change. Um, and I think that's the next step in the long-term research over there. And uh, I was involved in uh, a, a study uh, funded by the Indonesian Environmental Program that started to look at that issues of, uh, of developing a multi-criteria analysis approach for uh, how looking at climate change adaptations at different sectors, fisheries, um, uh, marine, um, forestries, uh, water, uh, infrastructure. It's a qualitative approach, but they start to bring the idea of interconnecting all these uh, different sectors together. And um, in, the, in, in the climate change community, for example, in the IPCC, um, they have uh, been developing this called integrated assessment model. So basically, it is uh, for the economy, is, they call they use a global uh, equilibrium models that simulate the change in the whole economy in the world. Um, based on change in agriculture, change in forestry, change in industry center, migration of people, and the climate change. But there are totally no ocean in there in that model right now. Mm. So I think the next step is to add ocean into their component so that uh, we can then start to integrate this, um, this assessment um, in terms of a, uh, a numerical sense in, in doing quantitative assessments of the potential implications of climate change at different tech sectors and how they impact each other. But at the more uh, short terms, we can already do that by using some more uh, weather assessment approach. Uh, for example, I think the approach that um, you have been pioneered in uh, redfish, I think that's totally applicable to do this kind of cross-sector analysis. We can have weather appraisal approach for, for some closely related sectors that we are already identified as potentially interconnecting uh, as the first proxy of the potential effects of climate change. And that may be the, the kind of approach that we should be going on, particularly for the data limited fisheries. Um, I mean, with further 
with our advancement in, in modeling tools and uh, collecting of more data or compiling, for example, more historical data, we would be start to get a more idea about that by uh, attributing uh, effects of how climate change or climate variability in contributing the, the changes. For example, um, the, the study that is now being considered by Nature, we actually did a comp multimodal compare using the multiple model comparisons. We compared the relative importance of fishing, large scale oceanographic changes, and uh, long term warming, how much it is contributing to the observed change in the uh, mean temperature of the catch. What we find is that um, qualitatively, fishing has a slightly more impact, but there's no significant difference in terms of the contributions between fishing, large scale oceanographic indices, as well as long term warming. So it seems that it depends on which ecosystem, but on average in the whole world, they seem to have equal contributions to the observed changes. 